Hi, everybody. Welcome to Curious Minds. My name is Ted Ryan. I'm the Archives and Heritage Brand Manager for the Ford Motor Company. I've got what I think is the best job in the world. I, I get to take care of the Ford Motor Company Archives Collection. I've got a great team uh, that's been working with me over the years. So if anybody's ever written the archives, I'm sure that, that you know them by name. I'm very excited today to introduce Nate Rapp. Um, I just, and I just said, I've got one of the best jobs in the world. But after you hear Nate speak this morning, you may decide that he does. Uh, he's a historian and nationally recognized expert in historical documents and artifacts. Our paths crossed several years ago when I was still the archivist to Coca-Cola, but I'm only going to tease that for a moment because I know that Nate is going to cover that in his talk. Uh, Nate's going to recount some of the stories of the documents and collection that he's worked with over the years and is now published in his book, The Hunt for History. With that, let me turn it over to you, Nate, and go from here. Uh, thank you, Ted. Thank you for all the folks at uh, Ford. I am very excited to be part of this uh, this series of Curious Minds. Thank you for the kind words. I do have a very interesting job, a different one. I think it's safe to say that you don't run across a lot of people who do exactly what I do, um, which is to go out in the world looking for the most important, the most interesting pieces of history, wherever they are, uh, wherever they're hidden. Sometimes they're famous pieces of history. Uh, sometimes they are pieces that no one knew existed. And so I never sort of know what's going to come my way. And when the phone rings, I never know who it's going to be or the nature of the inquiry. Um, but let's get started. Let me give you a little bit of background on how I got to uh, um, where we are now and why I decided to write this book, The, the Hunt for History. Um, so if you could move to that first slide. This is my father. Our firm finds these documents, but also finds them new homes. We are on at the front of discovery, and our job is to make sure these things are saved and then passed on to the next generation. But to show you that this is built not from uh, a standard corporate model, but from a, a passion, someone who uh, lived and breathed this uh, this this feeling of history, this desire to be close to history. This is my dad and my aunt. My dad grew up in Asbury Park, as you can see from the slide. This is 1960. He is identified as 11 year old Civil War collector Stephen Rabb. He was given this uh, briefcase, this portfolio by his dad. It's supposedly belonged to Han Hannibal Hamlin. I mean, some of these things are 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 tales and aren't true, but. This is this is him as a historically passionate young man and collector. When I was growing up, and you'll see another funny photo, which you, you're not allowed to put on any social media, but you'll see another funny photo of, of, of me. But to show you how his passion bled into my childhood, uh, he encouraged me to write letters to famous people. And some of them were businessmen. Some of them were uh, politicians. You can see here that I wrote to Colin Powell. And he said... Flatter them a little bit so they are encouraged to write you back. Of course, I was a child. I don't think they'd respond to to me now. But um, you know, when a ten year old writes you, then uh, you know your your rate of return is a lot higher. But he answered my question, which is who, what inspired you to be the person that you are? And he writes that General George C. Marshall, but basically his parents. And I also asked him what he wanted to be remembered for, and it's putting the welfare of his troops first. And I, I think his legacy has held up pretty well. Uh, but he took the time to write me not once, but three times. And this is just one of the letters. All right, this is the aforementioned uh, embarrassing photograph of me. That is my father in Civil War, in his, in his Union soldier hat at a Civil War reenactment. His goal was to pass on his passion for history to the next generation. You know, I don't know what I'm wearing. I, I can't recall what, what I can tell you is that I am holding a Civil War sword. And obviously, my father, who no doubt knew exactly what the 36th Regiment, the 7th Infantry of the Pennsylvania Reserve Volunteer Corps was, is passing that along to me. Um, of course, I'm holding a sword, which I would use to fight with my brother. I mean, they're little plastic thingies, but um, it was sort of built into our lives. We went to Gettysburg for uh, our vacations. We, um, we... We held the ground at the at Little Round Top, uh, where Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, Chamberlain and the 20th Maine protected against the advance of Lee's troops during the Battle of Gettysburg. We hunted for bullets on the battlefield. We found them, only to later learn that it was, in fact, my father who was planting them. 
but he, you know, he succeeded in, in making his passion something that uh, went to the next generation. Fast forward a number of years, I am. I decided to join to join this business, this firm, in when I was in my mid twenties. And the very first thing that my dad taught me was, um, don't assume. Don't take someone else's word for it. Do your be your own expert. Do your own work. You know the nut. Everybody says, "How do you know it's authentic?" And that's the nuts and bolts of what we do. It's 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 the basic uh, it's the basic skill without which you cannot participate in this. It would be like being an art dealer without being able to tell if you were dealing forgeries. If you're, you know, passing on title to these important pieces of history, the very basic skill, the barrier to entry is: Can I? tell what's real and what's not. And within that, can I take some the, the most challenging element of that is that can I take someone a supposed expert's uh assessment disagree with it and end up being correct. I mean in, in the end that's that's the um that's the definition of a mastery of a skill. Can you look at something and not simply piggyback on that person's opinion but apply your own knowledge. This was a an early lesson that I learned a colleague was quoting us this sliver of a survey. George Washington was a surveyor. He charted the lands around Mount Vernon. He charted, he was, he was a surveyor for the crown. And he went back, he surveyed back in what back then was the West, what today we know as Ohio. Um, but back then that was the distant West. But, you know, the, the most valuable financially, monetarily of these are surveys of Mount Vernon because he's so closely tied to Mount Vernon. This purported to be a, a sliver of a survey from Mount Vernon uh, that he he wanted to charge thirty five thousand dollars for. Now, if it were if it were really what it purported to be, that's not an unfair amount of money, and it came with a certificate of authenticity signed by Charles Hamilton. Charles Hamilton is somebody who is not well known outside the field, but within the field, he's an expert. He is long since passed away. He was. He'd been doing this for a generation, had built many great collections, and was a well-known autograph expert. His certificate of authenticity means something in a world where most don't. Um, I took one look at this, and I was thinking, that is all wrong. The lines go up and down. The scribbles are too cramped. It looks like more modern handwriting to me. I mean, I'm glossing over what took me a decade to be able to assess. but. To me, that just I, I just had this visceral negative reaction to it. If you ever read read the book Blink, um, Malcolm Gladwell says that somebody who knows what they're doing in any in any given industry or, set, or uh, field will be able to have an initial reaction, and subsequent research, which will be necessary, will only bolster will in most cases bolster that initial reaction, and that's what I had. So I began researching this piece. I found not two copies of this document, but four copies of this document. The authentic one had sold at Christie's. A final version, which was authentic, had sold at Sotheby's. And I found two forgeries. This is a forgery. Certificate of authentic authentication aside, this is a forgery. And the other one was had been donated, had been bought by a private collector and donated as an authentic document to Williamsburg, the Colonial Williamsburg, the archives there, which said they have amazing archives. Uh, but they accepted the donation. Um, and we went down to look at it, and it was clearly done by the same forger. So the idea in authenticity to trust your instincts and to know your own subject was was the sort of basic building blocks where I started. Uh, let's go on to the next one. This was another one, and a letter entirely in the hand of Abraham Lincoln, right? This is a famous letter. It's published in a variety of books. It shows up in the papers of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's quoted. The story of the great Hiram Hibbert is known. Uh, but look at this letter. There's something wrong with it. Look how the lines of the letter are at a different angle than the signature. Look how there's no cross through the X of Executive Mansion at the very top. Look how the date line, Washington, February 24, 1865, slants down and becomes cramped at the end, almost as if the writer made a mistake. There are countless little examples like that. This showed up in a, in a dealer catalog for $20,000, and we would have bought it if it had been authentic. But 
there were too many mistakes, and we ended up proving that it was, in spite of its storied history, uh, and poor Hiram Hibbard, uh, it was a forgery. I don't know who forged this one or the Washington document. Um, you know, in a sense, the good forgers are artists. I don't say that in any kind of positive way, but it, it takes a skill to be able to fool experienced people. Um, as just as good art forgers are themselves artists. It's not an honest art, uh, but it is an art. In any event, I don't think this is a particularly good forgery, but it fooled a lot of people. The first inkling I had of the emotional power of history, these documents, you know, we buy and we sell these things. We are a boutique antique business that operates in a very niche field. But what we do matters, and, I, and I'll get more to that in, in, a, in a couple minutes. But my first inkling of this, I'm something of an outdoorsman. I enjoy hiking, uh, um, spent a lot of time in the national parks. And so when somebody emailed us saying they had this letter, I got excited, and I will explain why. This is signed Father. Now, if there's anyone out there who recognizes this handwriting, I will be super impressed. Uh, it, this is father in this case is Theodore Roosevelt. He's writing to his son Quentin, Quentiqui, as he called him, the apple of his eye who died in World War One. He's writing not this is as written as president. He's writing not from Washington, but from next slide, da, 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 Yellowstone Park. Roosevelt took a, a very famous trip to Yellowstone Park in 1903. Looks very different than it does today. But you can see here, he calls him Blessed Quentiqui. I love you very much. Here's a picture of a mule that carries, among other things, my bag of clothes. There are about 20 mules in the pack train. Dot, dot, dot. And then he draws the mule. That's not a terrible drawing of a mule. I'm not sure I could do any better. But this isn't like, you know, a formal, uh, this is a man, by the way, who was himself a serious outdoorsman, an actual outdoorsman, who, Took the, took the time from the back country or from whatever lodge he was in to write home his son. And he wasn't, this wasn't a, a lengthy letter, but it, it, it feels like the words of a loving father towards a son that he genuinely missed. First thing he says is, I love you very much. Setting aside the outdoors wilderness uh, element that appealed to me, these are real people. There is an emotional attachment that comes with these historical documents that takes a piece of paper that may be worth a fraction of a penny and causes someone to spend $25,000, which is what we sold this for. We sold it to the, the National Park Foundation, which is the fundraising wing of the National Park Service. A, a very, not an incredibly historically important letter, but an emotionally evocative letter. Some letters, and here's Theodore Roosevelt, there's his real signature. Some letters are incredibly historically important, amongst the most important that were ever written by any American. But you don't know that without further research. In a sense, the importance is staring you at the face, but you have to recognize it when you see it. So when my dad saw this in another dealer catalog, look what the beginning says. Of course, I shall not feel real easy until the vote has actually been taken. But apparently everything is now all right. I have always been fond of the West African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. If I had not carried the big stick, the organization would not have gotten behind me. And if I had yelled and blustered as Parkhurst and the similar dishonest lunatics desired, I would not have had 10 votes. Now, he's saying what may be the most famous political expression in American history, speak softly and carry a big stick. Okay, well, maybe he said that a thousand times. He likely did. But what we learned was, this was the first time we've ever used it. This is the genesis of that American speech, that, that American phrase. And so you take another example of a sheet of paper worth a fraction of a penny, not written as president, written as governor. And you take away from that this, this emotionally... Uh, impactful moment in American history, sort of the dawn of the American 20th century, uh, of which Ford was such a, a crucial element. Um, and Theodore Roosevelt, in a sense, ushering it in with this very letter, this, this speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. 
the the dealer ha- had no idea what this was. My father and I was a child when when he bought this letter. Um, said, "Boy, this is awful early. I wonder what that means." Going and researching it and realizing that the letter to Henry Sprague was, in fact, the initial example. This letter is re- listed as a national treasure on the Smithsonian website. Um, and I, I draw this example to just simply show that some, you know, not only the importance of these and inspirational element of these letters, but sometimes it's hiding in plain sight. It requires you to be able to recognize it. This is another, this is, you know, I, I wanted to show you this piece, which we found in an old mainline. I say mainline because I'm, I'm, I'm from the mainline of Philadelphia, but. To show you how you can capture these crucial moments of innovation and invention through the eyes of the inventors using these documents. You know, I had never thought, I hadn't put a, I knew that this was an issue, of course, but I hadn't put a great deal of thought into the mimicry of flight uh, to birds in the minds of the Wright brothers. This is a letter signed by Orville, Orville Wright. And he's basically saying that they did intently watch birds fly in the hope of learning something. But in fact, it was only once they had discovered what it is that they had discovered that they could look back and say, oh, look, that bird's doing the same thing. And he likens it to the work of a magician. Learning the secret of flight from a bird was a good deal like learning the secret of magic from a magician. After you once know the trick and know what to look for, you see things that you did not notice when you did not know exactly what to look for. And I think that's that's I think that's true in life, but it's certainly a unique full in, a unique insight into how the Wright brothers uh, did what they did. Let's come to Edison. We were contacted by the great 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 grandson of um, uh, John Cruzy. Cruzy was one of Edison's chief lab technicians at the time when he was working to make something out of his light discovery. So the discovery of the the ability to light the light bulb, you know, people don't think of it, about it this way, but you know, before there was a light bulb, when the sun went down, your day was over, more or less. You know, you you had candles, but you know the 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 structure of the American day was very different because the sun was the the ultimate arbiter. But the ability to create an environment where light existed constantly uh, changed the way that everyone in the world lived. The discovery of light, the light bulb was one element of that. Okay, so we have this light bulb. What do we do with it? Create a source of electricity. But how do we take it from the source of electricity, the electricity, to the light bulb? As in, how do you light an actual house? This is an this is perhaps the most important piece of that of that answer. In 1933, some of Edison's devotees, some of the young men who worked with Edison on in his discoveries, um, formed an association. And at one point, they dug up a piece, uh, an element of a street around the old, the east side, as this thing says, the east side of Christie Street, just opposite your old home where, where Cruzy used to live. And they dug up a piece of a wire, a, 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 a gosh, I'm going to get this, the, the technical term for this wrong. But basically what you see on the right hand side is rock surrounding two copper cables. In 1880, Thomas Edison put on a public demonstration flipping of a switch whereby the power source would deliver electricity and from in, in an underground fashion and light a house in this case his house it, this was the 1880 election he says if james garfield wins flip the switch and if he doesn't don't james garfield won they flipped the switch it worked this was the first home that was ever lit through this fashion the first the ability to light a home when they dug up that street 53 years later they found the original cables that Edison had used to light the first home, his home. And this man, F.A. Wardlaw, who was part of that association, gave it to, the, to some of the people who were closest to Edison at the time. So he gave this to Cruzy. So this tiny little piece of metal came from the Cruzy family with this little note of Wardlaw. Now, Wardlaw's name is... Wardlaw kept a lot of these things. There are things in the Smithsonian that Wardlaw uh, donated or or gave to someone who then donated it. Donated it, but you know, holding something like this really puts you at that moment that that moment of of innovation where you know dark became light, where the the nighttime became a place of not only darkness but light. This is simply the other side of that. This this is 
this is what we call a piece of provenance. This helps us date the piece and helps us understand, okay, well, is this authentic? Now, this sheet of paper doesn't do everything. You know, I have I have to go and do additional research. Is this what the wire looked like? And there are publications that describe this, the, these sort of uh, two-channel uh, copper wires, uh, re- descriptions written by people who, who were there at the time. You know, this is one of my favorite historical discoveries. This is, I don't know if anybody knows this picture, but the man on the, standing on the right is a very young, in mid-20s, Winston Churchill. And I like this for two reasons. First of all, it draws out the character of the man. And it is such an amazing feat, a transgenerational feat, that this, sur- that this piece of history survived at all. Winston Churchill was a young uh, correspondent, a journalistic correspondent during the Boer War, uh, early on in his life sort of the first, his first great global initiative. And he was on a train that was derailed and they were captured by the Dutch. And he was captured by a man named uh, Henrik Sparwater. I believe his first name is Henrik, but his last name is definitely Sparwater or Sparwater. And the man treated him well. Churchill wrote a tiny little note in pencil. That note said, I have been treated well by this man and I hope that if he is captured, that the British will treat him with equal respect. You're catching Winston Churchill at the beginning of his life. He's from a well-known family, but himself is not is not he's not the the bulldog sitting in the in, in ten downing, uh, dr- driving the British to victory. He said, "Look, he's a young man." But you're capturing him at this unique moment in, in his life, and he writes this tiny little note, gives it to this man. The man has never had the chance to use it because he's killed. This is that note. The bearer, H.Y. Sparwater, has been very kind to me and British officers captured in the uh, escort armored train. I shall be personally grateful to anyone who may be able to do him any service should he himself be taken prisoner. Winston S. Churchill. 1899. That piece of paper stayed in South Africa for more than a century. It was taken off the dead body of Sparwater, kept by his family, donated to an institution. The institution was a private one. Uh, run by a, a family. They sold this piece of paper to us. The owner drove 300 miles to a local FedEx. The piece crossed the Atlantic Ocean, where we uh, received it. It's now in a private collection in Idaho, of all places. But think of the think of the this the survival of this sheet of paper, and with it, the survival of this piece of history, the knowledge of what happened in the character of Winston Churchill at such a young age as a minor miracle. I mean, a century in deep rural South Africa. So I, I just, I love the story of the document for so many reasons. And, you know, in some cases I'm sad to see these things go. And this is one of them. This is how Ted and I, uh, Ted Ryan and I met, not at this exact event. We were not, neither one of us was at this exact event. <laughs> Actually, if you look, if you look sort of off to the left, you'll see us. Now, um, I want to say 63, I think it's 64. Ted Ted, uh, can correct me later. Um, uh, Martin Luther King wins the Nobel Peace Prize, and the citizens of Atlanta are touched to honor this this, this son of Georgia, this son of Atlanta, uh, this prominent citizen who has done so much to advance the cause of civil rights. And but there are elements within the community that are not receptive to that. Um, elements of uh, backward thinking and uh, not open mindedness, and bigotry, who did not feel that in spite of King's accomplishment, that he should be honored um, in any kind of open way in Atlanta. And there were citizens who. I believe it was the mayor of Atlanta who said, we can't do this. This is our guy. He's done a great thing and we need to honor him. And they approached the major company at the time, this, the, the community, the corporate community leader at the time in the city, which was the Coca-Cola. And a man named Edward Edgar Florio, who was a senior executive there, uh, along with the head of, of Coca-Cola, took on the initiative of saying we won't stand for this 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 will take place we will honor this man who's done so much for our community and for the world and they organized a a benefit in his honor to celebrate his having won the the nobel peace prize 
Um, and King was touched by this. He was touched by the bravery that some men showed in the face of bigotry to stand up and say, this man is one of us and, and uh, he deserves uh, the ultimate co uh, commendation. Florio was, was certainly at the top of his mind and he wrote him a letter that the family kept. This is that letter where he says, I must confess that few events have warmed my heart as did this occasion. It was a testimonial not only to me, but to the greatness of the city of Atlanta, the South, the nation, and its ability to rise above the conflict of former generations. And really appreciate that beloved community where all differences are reconciled and all hearts in harmony with the great principles of our democracy and the tenets of our Judeo-Christian heritage. Notice the repeated use of the word our. I think that's powerful. In any event, uh, we sold that to a private collector. Ted can tell you how he stumbled across it. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but Ted found that at one point we had, we had, so we, in any event, we bought this from Forio's descendants, his, his direct heirs, you know, nobody knew about it. I suppose Forio kept, much to Ted's chagrin, Forio probably took it with him. The private collector, Ted said, well, can you get this back? And, and I said, I don't know the answer to that question. Approached the private collector, Fast forward, I don't know, maybe um, two to three weeks of, of negotiating with the private collector. Uh, we waived any fee that we would take. Um, the archives of Coca-Cola, it found its way back home, let's say. The archives of Coca-Cola reacquired it. But, and, that, and that itself is, is a wonderful story. But, you know, as I'm reading these things, as you read these things to yourselves and you see what these men and women say, not only in a history book, but in the original letter, it really captures that inspiration and emotion. And it's really hard to read some of these things without having that feeling. And I want to end with this. I hope this is the last slide. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll take back that I want to end with this. I, we have this, I, I have, I, I'm, you know, my household consists of a, a, a strong-willed wife and a strong-willed um, eight-year-old daughter. So we have this hanging in our, in our house. The, not the original, the original sold to a, a an executive at a nonprofit up in New York City, but an auto, one of my predecessors in this field, an autograph dealer, you know, more than a century ago, went to Susan B. Anthony and tried and wanted to sell her some autographs. And he thought, well, why not sell her a bunch of autographs of men? She could have thrown the letter away, but she didn't. She decided to respond, and she did so. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny um, with with spicy language, where where you know, and the underlinings in this are hers. I am especially interested in the autograph signatures and pictures of distinguished women. When you get a collection of autographs and portraits of the distinguished women of the last century, and then she lists who this woman would be, I will talk about patronizing you. But while women are by law excluded from a voice in the government under which they live, her, her underlines, I can only work for their emancipation. I know you think women are the pets of society. That they may be, but to be a pet her underline is not to be an equal. And what I want is for women to be equal before the law in every respect. I challenge you to read that and not feel inspired in your everyday life. And if you do, I think you get an inkling of the power that history can convey to us today uh, and how history doesn't live in the past. It is very much a fire that burns in the present. With that, I'll conclude and, and I'll kick it back to kick it back to you all. Nate, thank you so much. Uh, uh, fascinating. And I, across, like I saw an old auction catalog of Nate's when I was still at Coca-Cola that had that letter, and it was exceptionally significant within the, the history of the Coca-Cola company. There's a great quote where one of the Coke execs says to the leadership at the time, the city of Atlanta needs Coca-Cola more than Coca-Cola needs the city of Atlanta. You're going to have to decide if you're going to support Dr. King or not. And then the dinner went off. So when the company was able yeah. to reacquire it, it was very significant. And I have to endorse Nick and or Nate in one other fashion. 99% of the time, he makes sure that the items find their way to the appropriate institution or individual. Um, uh, he's placed collections at the Smithsonian at different museums, different places over the years. So uh, uh, that's uh, it's a fantastic legacy that he and his father have. So I see some questions up there. Uh, the first one, Nate, I'll take, I don't know if you can see it. Is it true that Bonnie and Clyde actually wrote Henry Ford thanking him for the VA? Uh, there's a letter from Clyde Barrow that is at the Henry Ford Museum that is purported to be, I use the word purported, Nate, you, know, you should like that one, uh, 
from Clyde Barrow, but I don't know that it's ever authenticated, but uh, uh, it, it, that's one of those instances where you never let the truth get in the way of a good story because it's a very humorous letter. Uh, thanking Henry Ford for the capacity to, to outrun the competition, as he as he says. Uh, Nate, the next one for you. Do you have any uh, opinions on the accounts and correspondence related to Oak Island? You know, I confess I, I don't. I'm not familiar with that. I don't, I don't know what that's about. I need more information. Do you no, know? I don't either. <laughs> Isn't that one where they're yeah. trying to to dig up? I think it's one of the the, the TV shows where they're trying to dig up uh, and find a treasure out there. Uh, the next one. Uh -oh. a Churchill piece of paper enhanced in any way. I would expect the pencil to have worn off more. It was not enhanced. That is, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, th these things survive a lot more than you would think if they're not kept, they're kept away from light, direct sunlight or an overly light environment or moisture or too acidic an environment. You know, this was kept in probably some file cabinet in the family and then it was donated to a museum where they knew how to take care of it. I think it's pretty stable, but no, it was not enhanced. That was interesting. How did you find that photo of Churchill in the Boer War? I found it when I was looking for the uh, illustrations for the book. Uh, gosh, I want to say it's uh, like a Getty image or something like that. We bought the rights to it for the book, but it's a, it's it's actually you know it, it's I think it's the only photo of Churchill from that from that conflict. Interesting, interesting. Uh, the next one is more of a private one, Nate. Uh, you can see it, uh, a gentleman whose uh, grandfather worked as head of Ford Photographic and he has a collection that he, he it was wondering if you would be interested in. I, I guess more generally, if anybody else has feedback like that, uh, how can they get it to you? What what typical parameters do you uh, take when you look at a collection and, and, and if it's worth your interest or not? Well, I mean, it sort of depends on what the intent of the, uh, the 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 owner is. I mean, I'm looking at this, and, and Ted, you'd have more knowledge on this subject than I would. But Ford Photographic, from I, I don't know what Ford Photographic is. I presume it's, it relates to the company, but th that seems very sort of central to what you all do. Um, you know, if the if the intent is is to donate or to get an appraisal and donate, um, you know, that's one direction. If the intent is to sell. But any of them, I'm happy to take a look at it no matter what the intent is. And then just go to our website, rabcollection.com, R-A-A-B collection.com, and send us, uh, you know, go to the contact page and send us a, some, you know, an email or, um, you know, a form and and uh, it will get to me. Just say, just say attention, Nathan, it will get to me. That's great. Uh, are there any letters written by George Washington in his own handwriting? Yeah, I'm looking at one right now. There's one right there. <laughs> uh, yes, the, George Washington wrote many letters, and they are very desirable. We sell more Washington letters and Lincoln letters than uh, any other historical figure, and that's not because they're cheap. They're really not. Um, yes, he wrote many letters. Uh, this is almost like a busman's holiday, but I have to admit that I don't have a single historical document in my house right now. <laughs> I've thought of, you know, family, it's just not, a, that's not in my genes to want to acquire a letter like that. So I'm always curious when people do, but uh, is there anything from Ford Motor Company history, <clears throat> Nate, that has caught your attention uh, that you think might be of interest? Any events, any Henry Ford items that have come across your, your desk over the years? Yeah, we've carried letters uh, in in the realm of automotive history, and specifically um, with Henry Ford. There was, so you're gonna, you know, we're general. So by nature, we're generalists. We're not. Um, we don't focus on any given era. We focus on a variety. So right now, I'm looking at. There's John Adams. There's James Madison. George Washington. There's William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So you know, I'm. I'm. We're. We're kind of uh, generalists. But we had that wonderful uh, letter signed by uh, Ford when he was on that t tour. Was it with Coolidge? That Goodwill yes. tour when he went around the country? I loved that thing. It was signed by a number of, of the folks there. But there was some Goodwill tour with, with Coolidge and Ford. and, and the uh, who else was on that? Yeah, the bag of us. There's two really good questions made up here, and I'm going to, so can you explain more about how you determine if a document is forged? I know that's as much a skill as a artistry from your perspective as well. Things like wavy line spacing or cramped writings. Uh, I know a lot of it's just experience, but can you guide us a little bit on uh, how you come to the decision of a forgery? 
Uh, yes, and it's not what you would think. Uh, you can generally authenticate a document without looking at the signature at all. In fact, the signature is often the last thing you, that I look at because the signature is the most easy thing to forge. Uh, a forger, a good forger, can sit down and practice a thousand times and eventually get to the point where they could fool most, not all people. I'd like to, I'd like to feel like I can't be fooled, but, uh, you know, honest, experienced people make mistakes. But the key is, the whole context. What's the paper? What's the ink? What's the date line? Was that person in that location when the letter, you know, you can't, you can't have a letter from Washington from Valley Forge if, in fact, he was in Morristown at that time. That's not possible. So we, we once were looking at a letter of John Marshall, and I contacted our colleague who's the head of the papers of John Marshall, and he said, this is not John. This is his brother James. John was in Richmond at the time, and this is dated from somewhere else. So that, you know, I've seen signed photographs of the Beatles dated, um, you know, after John Lennon had was was dead. So that's not possible. Dead, dead people don't often sign uh, his uh, photographs. The. There are every little element. Think of authentication as a puzzle where everything has to fit. If one piece is off, <clears throat> there's something off about the thing. Yes. Could somebody have written up and down? Uh, yes, but keep in mind back then people were taught how to write in a way that they're not today. People were taught penmanship. So someone with Washington's educational background and status would have been taught penmanship. So the letter I'm looking at right now, it's a, it's a, it is as if he had, you know, you can't think of it in modern terms. If we all sat down and wrote something, it would be up and down because we weren't taught that. But and we have we have lined paper. We have we have a cheat sheet. But that didn't come into being until during the Civil War. So. It would be uncommon to find something of Washington where it was really wavy. So, yes, that itself would not be a reason to dismiss it as a forgery. But there were tons of other paper was the wrong size. Uh, the, the the existence of four different copies was wrong. W with the Lincoln, there were a hundred different elements that were off. You can't think of authentication as, um, as okay, there's that one thing, because that's not how it works. We've got okay. We're gonna I'm gonna squeeze you for time because there's three questions. So I'm gonna combine two, but I'm gonna ask the the tough one first. Sometimes historical research turns up uncomfortable truths, uh, <clears throat> such as the Jefferson uh, Sal and Hemings relationship. Uh, when in your experience have you learned something to challenge your belief of, about a historical narrative? And I know you addressed a couple of these in your book, and I got to put in a plug for for Nate's book. Uh, it's it's a great read. So. Look it up. So, can you, if you can answer one of those real quick, and then I'm gonna, I've got one final one to take us out. Yes, uh, we, and this is in the book. The story, story that's in the book. We had a, a man come to our office who said that his wife, or his wife, his mother had an, had an affair with Martin Luther King, um, and that he had a letter from the jailhouse to of Dr. King to his mother, which was essentially a love letter. Um. It's not actually a historical discovery that Martin Luther King had affairs, but it's quite another thing to see it in front of you. Um, it, it was the my answer is not is going to surprise you a little bit. I was surprised not by the letter. They actually had one. I mean, when I looked at it, it was in fact the love letter of Martin Luther King written from jail. And what surprised me was the son's reaction. This was an in immense source of pride to the family. They, they, their their lives intersected this great man. I mean, I'm not here to judge what other people do with their lives or King's actions, but I can say that the the feelings of the family of the woman were intense pride in their connection with Dr. King. So that and that surprised me. OK, I'm going to combine and uh, Matthew, who wrote these two. These are two good questions. What is the one artifact or document that you're most proud of finding? And then what is the unicorn out, item out that you're dying to find? Uh, let's start with the unicorn. Matthew, I give you this challenge. Go find me a document signed by William Shakespeare. <laughs> the man the man lived. He existed. He was a writer. He didn't die as a child. This stuff has to be out there. But where is it? There are four known autographs which, of Shakespeare. They are internally inconsistent, which means that one doesn't match the other. They're all in the British Library. Uh, if you found an autograph of William Shakespeare that was definitely authentic, you'd be looking at tens, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the item artifact I'm proud of acquiring. I mean, in a sense, it's the latest awesome thing that I've found. I mean, it's like asking me what's my favorite. 
I can't choose my children. I can't. I can't choose my favorites amongst my children. <laughs> and the last question: What can a company? Like, yeah, what can a company like uh, Ford learn from your work? What can history tell us today about uh, tomorrow or the present? With such a storied history, learn from your work. I mean, I, I don't. I, I think it's more, more. What can we learn from a company like Ford? I mean. I, my work is simply discovering and understanding and finding a new home and recognizing value, historical, emotional, and, and in my case, financial. This is, after all, how I, uh, you know, put put uh, food on my on my daughter's table. Um, but you know, it's it's what can we learn from things like this? You know, we don't exist in a vacuum. There are people who've done what we've done before us. Some have done them great. Some some have done them well. Some have not. There are some lessons to be learned. But I would strongly encourage you and everyone to take pride in the history of the company and to, uh, you know, look on the innovation and uh, the actions of the people before you at, at, at Ford as, a, as, as an experiential learning element for our lives today. So I, I, what can they learn from me? I mean, I guess the lesson that I can teach is don't be ignorant of history. Look around you. This stuff matters. It's not, you know, it, 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 and your, your, your firm is unique in having, you know, such a storied and powerful history. And Ted, you know, swims in that, in that lake every day. Yeah. I've got to amplify and close on that. Yeah, it's, it's, earlier this week, I held the blue sheet in my hand that launched the Mustang program signed by Lee Iacocca. And you feel the history oozing out of a document like that. Nate, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, look up his book. It's a great read. And, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today for Curious Minds. Thank you.